Floating down the river on a tugboat, Andy sees a family having a picnic or something near the river with a balloon floating away. Andy tries to reach out to them with the father brandishing his revolver to deter him away. Maybe don't hold a birthday party near the river and create items that people can mark your locations from far away? I don't know. We see major cities and coastal areas of Australia were heavily infected. Kay says they should go more inland where there are less infected and there are also marks for supplies. Andy disagrees with his wife, saying it's safer to stay on the boat with their diminished rations. You know, I gotta agree with Kay, they have a baby to feed, why not attempt to go where more supplies may be? Never mind, Andy f suddenly finds a capsized sailboat with tons of food and even wine right after this conversation. Convenient. Kay goes back to the boat by herself to get a razor for her Rugged. husband, and a zombie breaches from the back door of the boat to bite her off screen. Now, why didn't this faceless zombie that we never see attack Andy beforehand when he was making twice as much noise when he was on the boat before? Kay is shown to be bitten as we see the symptoms of the virus on papers, as they say it takes 48 hours for someone to turn rabid. Andy says she will bleed out much sooner and wants to get her to a hospital. I don't know, man. I know she's your wife, but finding a hospital when you wouldn't even risk going inland in this apparent zombie apocalypse is going to be nigh impossible. As desperate as you are, having your wife turn out in the open with the crying baby probably is not your best option. You might just want to let her go peacefully, as I think that's what she would want in the first place. I find that the kits administered to Australia for the outbreak are really interesting, giving us a decent tiny glimpse into what the virus does and how, and how they responded. Once you're infected, you have to put a watch on to fully plan out your last 48 hours, as well as what is basically a lethal injection pen you stick straight into your temple to mercifully kill you, minus one sin. They find a car with a baby seat, full tank of gasoline, and the keys in just a few short minutes because of course it would be that easy to get a random car started after it's been inactive for months. Andy gets the car started just in time before a silent moving cackling zombie struts up to hit the window cliche. They stop the car to change the baby's diaper and Andy just lets Kay take the baby outside by herself to do it while he takes his eyes off them both. Dude, your wife is infected. Even if you don't want to believe it, why risk your baby. Kay starts convulsing on the ground and again he just leaves the baby out in the middle of the road. What if a random zombie shows up for a junior male? They drive for a bit longer as Kay desperately tries to run away from her husband and child not wanting to turn and get the both of them bit. Kay is a true one for being a realist and not wanting to risk her baby. You know my feelings about babies in a zombie apocalypse, but you gotta be smart if you're gonna keep one of those screaming, pissing, shitting crotch goblins on you at all times. But then Andy just stops her with a no. She sits by a tree and says she wants to be left alone. Andy reiterating with a more forceful no. Fuck this guy. She says it's her call, bro. Let her go. Honor her decision. They continue to drive when he sees a jittering person on the road and his choice is to swerve out of the way and slam into a tree. If you're so hellbent on saving your wife and no that the, the, if there, there's zombies out there, why uh, why avoid harming what is most likely a zombie? And Kay is impaled on a tree, causing Andy to pass out from seeing the injury. In that time, the zombie that stopped them does nothing to approach them, and Kay doesn't fully turn, so he can wake up and see Kay's eyes and mouth covered in Pooh's zombie honey. And also, so many YouTubers who cover this kind of story will use this as the thumbnail. Lucky for him, the screaming baby did not wake up the zombifying mom or get the outdoor zombie's attention. Nope, she only wakes up when Andy starts trying to unbuckle himself and reaches for the baby right in front of her without defending himself, causing him to get easily bit. What a dumb way to get infected, man! 
He goes out and injects the pin into her skull to kill her, but leaves his baby yards away from himself while he screams at the top of his lungs, really wanting to make sure that baby gets snatched up, bitten, or eaten. And like, he starts walking his baby when a gagged zombie walks on by. His course of action when he sees this is to yell at it, point a stick at it, and tell it to stay back. Do you know what these things are or not? What is the plan here? The zombie's kid comes out from the bushes, cuts his hand, and leaves blood on the tree for the zombie to rush over and lap it up as it follows the scent of the child's blood. With how easily distracted, slow, dumb, and restricted in their movements these infected are, I'm surprised Australia lost the war against them. But then again, Aussies also lost a war against emus. I'm not even kidding. Ask any Aussie. They'll tell you about it. Hell, look at this. When the army withdrew on November 8th after six days, of battle, two and a half thousand rounds of ammunition had been used to kill between 300 and 500 emus. In a second cull, soldiers destroyed thousands of emus before a ceasefire was called on December 10. Now the war is stuff of legend. After this, he just walks through the outback with no issue for hours until he finds a town right as night falls. He waltzes in a random school and this creepy ass teacher is just sitting in the corner with the light off. It's this far into a supposed zombie apocalypse and the best she has for fortification is a solar powered light outside and sitting in a chair in a dark corner. You're not going to board up any windows or anything else? Okay. She covers his bite wound, noting if people see it, they'll face trouble and and lets them stay the night. She says all the native people that were in the picture she has went back to their native land while society crumbled, making some kind of commentary about the modern entity of polluting the world, but yeah, she then just goes to bed. I know the whole wristwatch timer thing is well known for them and is kind of a guideline of when somebody's gonna fully turn, but why risk him turning sooner or getting any of his infectious liquids anywhere and get yourself and the baby bit or infected, especially since he passes out, choking on his orangish changing blood in the middle of the night. The woman says the baby's safest bet would be to find this native family that she has in this picture and hand the baby over to them. The baby's name being Rosie, by the way. Andy says he met them briefly. Yeah, I've seen them. Well, then you just head right back and tell Willie that Ed sent you. If you want to give this baby a second chance, that's where you go. Are we just going to ignore the part where the dad was a freaking zombie? You saw that he was dead. And what's that? He still goes on this journey to find the family? Are you crazy? Are you out of your mind? You have 32 hours left. Why not just let the old woman take her in case you, I don't know, run into a horde, run out of supplies, start season up again, and even turn while walking in the hot outback with your baby on your back? This is absolutely mad decision making and writing. You're trying to find a family where you know the father is a zombie that is still walking around. I do like the image of people's heads being buried under the dirt as an ominous sign of mystery. It reminds me of that one South Park episode. If you have children, be sure to bury their heads in the sand before you bury your own. Dad, I don't want to bury my head in the sand. It's the best way, Stanley. But the zombie springs from the ground to silently approach him. Thankfully, a guy in a nearby ditch just shoots it in the head just in time to save Andy, or the baby. The guy is pinned under a cylinder and gives Andy the chance to have a car and get away, while a less than intimidating group of three zombies shambles towards them because of the sound of the gunshot from earlier. I am failing to see the society-ending threat of all these zombies, and and I also bow to Andy's luck of just finding people that help him and getting more and more cars. The guy under the cylinder is named Vic, and he has this tiny safe haven with a girl and takes Andy out to get gas, only to bring him to a place where he keeps the indigenous kid from earlier in a cage as bait to lure infected so he can pick them off. Uh, I guess it's a decent strategy to lure them away, but I'm surprised the infected clustered this much 
to a silent cage when a gunshot earlier barely brought three. But, you know, they're coming towards the scent. That and why are you using a kid when just a wee little bit of blood does the trick anyways? Vic goes to another cage where he has another indigenous person locked up and pours blood around the cage, throws guts on top of it, and turns a radio on full blast to do the same thing of attracting zombies so he can pick them all off? Why have these people then? I, I don't understand why he is caging up the indigenous people. I guess it's to make some strange statement about racism and classism? Wouldn't the guts inside a cage suffice? I don't get the premise of this. The girl Lorraine notices the baby Rosie has a glob of pus on her left over from her father. Lorraine says she cleaned her up, but I'm just wondering why the baby is covered in pus in the first place. Wouldn't Andy have taken precautions to prevent a baby that would probably just put its open mouth on this liquid or lick on it on accident and get infected? Also, where did the pus even come from if it's not visible on him whatsoever since he is actively trying to avoid showing signs of infection? Andy sneaks away from the safe haven, thinking he has found people to look after his daughter once he dies, and nearly kills himself via the injector pin. Lorraine shows up right before that happens to reveal Vic got their group and Lorraine's husband killed, and trusting Vic to look after the baby is a bad idea. Wouldn't he wake up with Lorraine leaving and chase after her before all this could happen, though? How did she get this far without him freaking out? They conversate for what seems like forever. Lorraine says he is capable of selfish things, but instead of starting to move because they really need to get out of there, they just continued to sit there, loudly whispering long enough for Vic to show up and knock Andy out. Andy wakes up in a cage with the young indigenous boy from earlier named Toomey as he yells and screams for Vic to let him out. No zombies show up whatsoever amongst all of this, which is surprising since Vic was able to lug Andy's body all the way there at night where there's no sun, where blood and guts are already draped around this entire cage and make a lot of loud noises to use the cage and then chain him up slowly with nothing showing up. The zombie scene here only starts strolling up when Toomey talks about ghosts because, you know, zombies have great thematic timing. Andy takes the intestines and lasses it outwards so the hordes will pull on it enough to lift the cage door. Dog, Vic, if you're gonna keep people caged up, why in the hell would you have it where the door can be lifted at all? Is there not this new invention called a padlock out there in Australia? No? We're just gonna have it to where it can be easily lifted? Also, why does not even one of the zombies not even turn their head at the sound of this large metal cage banging on the ground not once but twice. Also, how would five zombies eating some innards on a rope have enough force to lift this cage door over a full-grown man trying to lift it on his own? Andy sneaks back in the safe haven, gets Lorraine and Rosie, sneaks into Vic's room, takes one of his guns and keys, and leaves. If this guy is such an erratic threat, why not just shoot him or use the injector on him in his sleep instead of risking him waking up to attack y'all. You've seen he is actually pretty good with a gun. Why risk it? And speak of the devil, Vic wakes up as they are escaping and runs outside with a hunting rifle. They left a gun readily next to him so he can run outside and shoot you. Why, if you're going to keep him alive, would you leave a live firearm anywhere near him? Lorraine slowly dives out in the slowest protect the president scene I've ever seen in a movie to get shot by Vic in the torso so and die. If only you had, I don't know, neutralized the threat beforehand. But eh, who cares, whatever. Andy hides in a ditch when Vic rolls up nearby, demanding he comes out and hand over to me, referring to her as her skin color only. 
driving home the sloppy message of racism and more. But I have to ask why Vic decided to stop here specifically. There's no markings to signify they stopped in this area. For all he knows, he is yelling at nothing and actually just making a bunch of noise to draw the unwanted attention of nearby zombies. Andy sees the rifle he picked up from Vic's room has no ammunition. Why would there be no ammo in a gun by this guy's bedside? He is a gun nut and honestly, if you're going to have a gun near your bed, it's going to be loaded. But he does keep a gun that's nowhere near his bed loaded. That makes sense. Vic drives off as Andy tries to break the chains. Toomey jingles the keys to show he can unlock their shackles. You didn't think to unlock your shackles earlier or sometime sooner? Just now? Okay. Toomey wakes up to see Andy licking the blood on the walls, but goes on like nothing happened as they walk around the following morning to find Toomey's father buried in a tree. Toomey, assuming a cure could be made by the village magic man, freaks out and they separate momentarily just to team up again to find a way back to his village for Rosie's sake. I will say the film has been dragging on for me and the themes are really falling flat with no real threat really shining through here. They find the family from the beginning of the movie with the gun-wielding dad digging a mass grave and asking Andy to use four rounds of his six-round revolver to kill him and his family of four since only the father is bitten? What? Why execute your family if you are the only one that's dying? Andy takes the gun with two shots left and considers his final option, but Toomey's arrival stops him. Toomey then puts white stuff on herself and the baby, saying it will mask their scent from the zombies, but Andy's scent already gives off the odor of the infected. You know, it would have been nice to use this earlier. Passing by a horde of infected eating a cow, they go through a dark tunnel to reach a smoke signal. It's here they see a number of infected leaning their heads against the wall, hibernating. I guess giving reason to why their heads are in the ground or why there's not much out in the middle of the day. This element of the zombies is barely explored though and I've seen it in other movies like the 2007 I Am Legend but it also doesn't make sense to see zombies out in broad daylight in the first place in earlier parts of the movie. But this begs the question again how did these types of zombies still take over in the first place? At the end of the tunnel Vic is waiting by a barrel fire when the sound of Rosie crying alerts him. Now, why would he be camping out right near a place where the infected tend to go to and hibernate in herds? All that warmth, smoky odor, and sound he is making is surely grounds for drawing attention, right? Andy runs up and lines up with other hibernating infected to blend in. While I would say minus one sin, not today. Vic sits there and whacks each zombie in the head without one of them waking up. Surely those loud thuds and Andy's screaming Vic's name would have rattled them awake. Their whole purpose is just to eat other people and animals. You would hear a loud noise and all this noise you would wake up. That's just how I would imagine zombies would be. Especially if they're there, they're, 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 they're the kind of zombies that apparently took over all, all of Australia. Andy misses his shot at shooting Vic easily as he waits until every infected is dead. Why would you not just fire the gun when there are still two or three infected that Vic hasn't killed yet? You are all already bit. Who cares if they bite you? But they won't even go after you anyways? You have better odds at killing Vic at that point. Vic walks away to pick up Rosie. And do you know what he does next? He cries. The final exchange with the, I guess, villain of the movie is just over like that. He passes Rosie over as he apparently is going to die from a gunshot wound. It's anticlimactic to say the very least. Toomey hit her head in the previous skirmish, making it hard for her to walk. As they dredge forward, Andy starts seeing his symptoms worsen due to the nearby scent and sight of an eviscerated rabbit, his eyes moistening with mucus. I have to say, with how boring this movie is, the effect and symptoms of this zombie virus are interesting for a zombie concept, minus one sin. Andy, in his final conscious moments as a living person, says, goodbye to his daughter and Toomey, binds himself and buries his head in the dirt, only for Toomey to turn him into a mule by getting on zombie Andy's back, tying some meat to a stick to make him walk forward as he infinitely tries to reach the meat right in front of him. While the image is neat, I guess, 
I can't help but wonder again how a zombie that's this easily controlled could again be a wide scale threat. I have repeated this fact over and over again, but it is insanity. That's why I put this movie I had never seen before in my other video, zombie apocalypses that should not have happened because this is just freaking stupid. Compound that with the fact that a tribe of natives are easily able to wipe out a horde with just pointy sticks and bring the body and burning the bodies. You're telling me Australia couldn't do the same as a whole nation? You uh, does Australia not have guns? Do you not have melee weapons? Do you not have sensibilities? Before the native elder kills Andy, Toomey stops him and sprays the perfume he used to cheer up his daughter one last time as a semblance of his humanity shines through in his vacant and blank stare. Seeing the soul leave Andy's body, the elder understands and releases him from his defiled earthly coil. While this movie dragged on and made no sense throughout, this one scene was decently made enough to remember, minus one sin. Toomey and the other natives bring Rosie to a village of people celebrating as the words thank you are written on Rosie's stomach. Andy's clothes and fishing lines draped on the tree he is buried in, ending his journey. A journey of stupid decisions, stupid people, and zombies that were never really a threat unless you are indeed stupid. Cargo is a five letter word, and you know what else is a five letter word? Stupid! Wow, wow, wow. Well, you're free to go, but right after your additional punishment, punishment, let the booting begin! They're moving in herds. They do move in herds. Look at this photograph. Oh, I get it. Cute. You leave this pen here and people are supposed to think, wait, that looks like a dick. Hey, Mr. Prime Minister! Andy! Aye, mate. What's a good word? We'll call on our brothers to help us fight. These white men are dangerous. No one is to go near them. 